Thank you for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast, a podcast created by dog trainers, for dog trainers, or anyone who's ever fallen in love with man's best friend. <laughs> well, you know, and, and here's a fascinating point because I, I want to tie Sarah right in with it. So, so we were talking <laughs> about, um, and I, I believe we talked about this too, Sarah, uh, newer trainers not asking for the time that they need to properly train the dog, which then leads to lack of advocating for the dog, you know, and everybody wants to meet this deadline. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, as Denise was saying, dogs are very smart. They're sentient beings. They're capable of choice and, and, you know, and even problem solving and all that good stuff. But that doesn't mean that you can just take their natural learning process and shrink the timeline down. Things don't work that way, right? Like you can't bake a cake twice as fast at 700 degrees. It just doesn't happen. Right. So, right. um, so the way that, the, you know, don't that, die that had Oh, what's that? Are you there? I'm I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah, hear, I can hear you. We can hear you good now. Okay. Sorry, my phone died. That had my hotspot on there. But I wanted to comment on what you just said as far mm -hmm. as advocating for the time that you need to train the dog. So a lot of times I'll get dogs that you know people have a you know a competition behavior that they they need solved or whatever and and like with my process it's going to be a while like i like to go back to start retrain the foundation and train mm -hmm. it from the ground up and so i always tell them like hey you know if you if you want to go this way it's going to be a while but i promise you at the end that result is going to be so much better than if we just try to put a band-aid on this and like get it competition ready like it's really really worth going back to the beginning getting that foundation in and building up brick by brick versus just saying, I've got to get it done by this time the trial goes. I right. just had um, at the seminar I just taught in Texas, she wants to fix her start line stay, says the dog's having some stress behaviors. She's recognizing now that there's stress behaviors um, and she wants to fix it and said, and you know, I said, you got to go back, got to build it up, got to generalize it, blah, 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 you know, the whole spiel. And she goes, okay, cool. But I have a trial in two weeks. What would you oh, do no. then? <laughs> I said, I would do a slingshot send, which means you hold the dog back and then you run like hell and try mm. to just get ahead of that dog. And like, I fully realize in this moment, this lady is not going to be able to outrun her fast, large dog. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, that's kind of what you get when you're retraining competition behaviors. Right. Like, and luckily this is just an agility trial. It's not a big deal. There will be another agility trial, um, but that's, you know, it's always worth building it the long way, in my opinion. Right. But the, the reality of the situation then then comes into play. And, and what we were talking about, like essentially the way that this came up was we were talking about, uh, I think we would all agree that this, is, this has been a good like shift in dog training is it, it became OK to an extent to expect from the owner. You know, like if, if you're feeling lazy, then you need to get unlazy. I don't know what to tell you, right? You know, you can't expect your dog to, to right. be solid if you're giving them like a half-assed effort. I mean, why would they be solid? That doesn't even make sense. Right. So it's it's been it's been then a matter of pretty much who's good at that or who can get good at that. And that mm -hmm. tends to dictate, it, it seems to me, who's going to be successful, who's going to do well, and all that good stuff is who can who can navigate the owners, right? And, you know, the what I was kind of uh, pushing toward next and what I wanted, you know, to, to hear you riff on a little bit more, because we were talking about confidence and Brent brought up the, if it's an older client, then like you kind of want that backup. And Denise said, uh, it is kind of like a downside, you know, if you're younger and people don't always give you like the respect or they just don't assume that you know what you're talking about type thing. Yeah. Kind of like we were talking about with the dock diving thing. You know? Right. You know, I, I do notice that to be kind of funny because when I'm dealing with an older client, you know, male, female, whatever, um, I, I noticed that I do have to drive the conversation a bit harder, if that makes sense. Like I, like I do have to, I'm the one who has to push the pace of it because if not, then they, they start explaining to me about all their dogs in the past and how they did it this way, that way, this way, you yeah, know? Yeah. And so I, I do kind of feel the, I guess I've never like thought to really articulate it, but I'm like, yeah, I, I guess I kind of feel them like, like stepping on a little bit, you know, on what, you know, if that's the way to put it. But, um, I, yeah, it is fascinating. People do tend to kind of put you in that box. And, and it's like we talked about earlier, I don't know if it's just a comfort thing, if it's like, you know, to suggest that the younger person knows less is to suggest that you know more and knowing knowing a lot is good type thing. I, you know, it, it who can say? I again, that comes from a confidence thing on the owner's 
point. So they think they have this long relationship with dogs and they think they're amazing and everything else, but now they're having to reach out and ask for this help. And now this young whippersnapper shows up and they know exactly what they're doing doing like that's that's going to be a hit yeah sorry a yeah. hit to their <laughs> whip, their confidence as well and so if we look at it that way <laughs> um sorry is that not a term we use anymore no go for it no no, no. Um, not since like 1932 like, oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> um so i think if we take into account that they they're sharing those things to help build their confidence in themselves. I'm just going to use again that as my answer for everything. And so if we so acknowledge far. that, yeah, they do know these things. And like Denise said before, if, if the, if, you know, like Denise said before, like if we give them more credit and, and listen to those things, even though they're not right, but like give them the benefit of the doubt that they do know some things and meet them where they're at might be a better way to approach that versus um, going into it like, well, I'm the dog trainer. Now I've got to convince them of my way. Um, mm -hmm. How about listen to what's worked for them? And maybe that's going to give you some clues on what will work for them in the future and adapt them. Yeah. So adapt those methods. So that will work for the dog that they currently have. Yeah. Very yeah, good point. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to dive into again. So I, I want to go into a little bit more of the bridging the gap stuff as well, because I think we're, we're doing a hell of a job talking about, you know, kind of a, a lot of the commonalities and we find out there's so much in common, even, even between the pet dog world and the sports world, we're right? Like we, we both have time limits, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of sides being taken. There is a aspect, especially in the behavior or when it comes to behavior work, mm -hmm. right? that I think balanced dog training and, you know, more of the R plus world uh, has a conflict with, right? And so this is the idea of, you know, how, to, how we deal with aggression, um, the tools that we use to deal with aggression, the techniques that we use, right? And I remember about six, seven years ago, I, you know, like I, I actually followed like Dr. Ian Dunbar, like my whole career, right? And I watched every seminar that he ever created, right? Um, and, you know, I was introduced to all these protocols and all these things. And I worked with veterinary behaviorists and I was introduced to a lot of stuff. Right. Um, and I used them and I utilized them and I saw what worked for me and what didn't work for me. And, uh, till this day, I use several protocols that I've learned, uh, for certain cases. And it's, it's been very helpful in my, in my toolbox. Um, but I've also, I also use remote collars for certain behavior cases. I also use, you know, correction. And I also use certain things, uh, not necessarily all up front, but at some point, you know, depending on where it is, you know, every, again, this is where we go into everything is based on context and the practitioner and what you're doing, how you're doing it. And at the same time, what we're looking at is we see kind of this conflict between uh, not a, a, a lack of understanding in behavior, number one, right? We see that. We see the lack of understanding of how emotion plays into behavior, right? We see uh, probably a misuse of tools and bad timing in many, many scenarios. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think of other variables. I'm just trying to pick it apart. Is there anything that you have in your, in your head, Denise, where we kind of argue a lot about this? I think... Uh, I am not, well, I should just say, I'm not well versed on how the balanced community handles behavior mm -hmm. issues. I actually spent a couple hours with uh, Chad Mackin on the phone mm -hmm. a couple days ago, said, kind of, can you help me out? Like, can you get me up to speed a little bit? And so he told me, he said, you know, there's so much range in the balanced community, True. but I can talk about me. I can talk about, sure. you know, and so we had a fantastic conversation. As a matter of fact, he's going to do an IG live with me cool. so we can start introducing this because it is, in my opinion, a, an enormous law for me not to understand whether I agree or not doesn't matter I really should know how you uh, uh, how a good balance trainer addresses behavior issues I'm not mm. talking about the shock mm. jock over on the edge yeah. a good one right. the big concern the big fear from our side is that you're changing behavior without changing the emotion that if you mm -hmm. punish suppression behavior stuff. yeah yeah uh and that is could where you, we always could go. you could you explain suppression for newer dog trainers yeah, so it means that the behavior on the outside is acceptable because you've taught the dog what is acceptable to show, but on the inside, the emotion is still roiling away. So if the dog was angry at dogs and therefore lunged, you can get rid of the lunge, but you can't punish out an emotion. You can't punish out the anger. Uh, and so that is an area I really would love to understand better because realistically, we can never know for sure what another feels. 
We, we can't right. know what the emotional reality is. And there's we no meter. Know, you know. No, we can know that if you tell your child, go to your room and think about what you did wrong, that not a child on the planet actually does that. Like, right. There, right. There are Turn my things, Xbox on. And... <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all know so... how we respond when mm -hmm. people tell us, shut up and whatever. We know how we feel angry inside, even if on the outside we're doing the correct things. Mm -hmm. And we know what would happen if we were no longer supervised mm -hmm. uh, at that point moment how we mm -hmm. and so it, it absolutely uh brings up questions for me about this but i feel like at first i just have to understand what people are doing mm -hmm. and then from there i can start trying to figure out if i can um make a case the one thing i will say which i guess would put me at odds with the the reward-based community is i do believe there's a very strong relationship but not only between how emotions affect behavior but how behavior affects emotions That's emotions yes. right and yes i did touch on this earlier with my own dog where i was talking about he has such a great need for structure and i think that the structuring him actually calms his brain so it mm -hmm. is a two-way street but it doesn't completely remove the reason for it. As soon as I take that structure off, he goes right back to having, because that's his wiring, that's right. in his brain. Right. And I would really like over time to be able to fix that. So I'm gonna try. Uh, and I do find that addressing his behavior is an issue. Another thing I'm very clear about, if my dog exhibits problematic behavior that is dangerous to me, himself or society, I stop that behavior. Control. I stop yeah. it. And there's mm -hmm. nothing positive about the way I stop it. It's not. I'm not doing it to punish the dog or make him uncomfortable. I'm doing it because the behavior must stop. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the reasons I'm stopping it is because some problematic behavior is reinforcing for the dog. Yeah. And I do yep. believe that some dogs, and I believe I have one, enjoy the act of lunging and being a mm -hmm. fool because I think yep. he just, he's bred to enjoy that. And yep. therefore it is not allowed to happen. Yep. And I do stop the behavior. Um, and that probably does put me at odds with some folks. Because right. I just feel so, it's like if you have a roast on your counter and you let your dog get it. Can I, can right. I ask, what would be the alternative approach to that? Because like as a balance pull doctor, pull, pull, pull the, the dog, dog away. Take the dog Simply away. Take him out of the system. Just remove it. Just right. remove yeah, it. But the thing is like with my dog, he's is an example. If I pulled him away, first of all, his opposition is very, very strong. So mm -hmm. pulling mm -hmm. him causes not only More drive, but yeah. absolutely. So I would be literally dragging him a hundred feet back to the car, to his mm -hmm. crate, with him screaming and scrabbling. And then when I got to the car, I have a new problem, which is how exactly am I gonna get him in the crate? Right. Because right. now he's lighting up every direction mm -hmm. and it's dangerous and you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what I do, it, I, I don't think it's so horrible, but as soon as I see that, I just reach down, up he comes by the collar, I hold him up, back mm -hmm. feet on the ground, and it takes three seconds. He just kind of goes, okay. Mm -hmm. Cause it's not going to work for you. I have mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm, and then I put him down and it's over. Mm -hmm. And then I feed him. I'm mm -hmm. like, you're all right. You're fine. I'm mm -hmm. calm, not mm -hmm. yelling. Mm -hmm. Everything is, you know what, buddy, you're okay. You're going to be okay. Put him down, feed him and then make decisions from there. Right. Um, Would... And he is on a collar, not on a harness. Right. Um, and I've been questioned about that. And I said, on a harness, I'm not safe because I don't have the, if, if the harness is in the back of his body, I can't keep myself safe. I can't keep society safe. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, I believe we all have rights and that does mm -hmm. include mm -hmm. me. And, and society has the right not to be lunged at by my right, dog. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Now I try very hard to avoid it. I try to put myself in places where he's not going to end up in that boat. But unfortunately that boat still does happen because I'm not mm -hmm. perfect. And because I thought it was going to be like this. And the next thing I know, it's a truck coming around the corner, like with a fire truck. I thought it was going to be a Hyundai, you know, I can't predict all the things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do use force. And mm -hmm. in the process of using force, I may or may not be punishing his behavior. He might be finding it unpleasant and therefore mm -hmm. it would be plus pu adding punishment, mm -hmm. which could be decreasing his behavior. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is it's not my intent, but it may well be my action. I don't know. Well, can, can I bring up a couple things that I, I just want to be said on the podcast? Because uh, one thing that I, I, I try to make clear, not just to our guests, but to the listeners, you know, is we don't, we don't ever want to like come on the podcast uh, as like disingenuous or as like a yes man or as like a whatever, or somebody who's, who's, uh, not willing to discuss something that could be seen as like a hot topic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then just me being totally upfront, you know, I, I do totally believe on, on like a, a personal and professional level from what I've seen 
when we talk about the fallout uh, of a correction, there are a ton of circumstances where the fallout is exactly why you gave the correction. An example being uh, snake avoidance training. It's hard on the dog, right? You, the dog smells the, the scent pheromone, big e-collar correction. The dog sees the fake rubber snake, big e-collar correction. The dog sees the real snake, big e-collar correction. And that's a fallout. The dog associates the snake as like, oh, fuck that thing. I'm staying away. But that was the point. That was the purpose. That was the function. So there, there are circumstances like that. And then, and then you know, the, the other example then, the more common example would be, um, I'll speak for myself, you know, and, and uh, just, just, you know, since you ask how a balanced dog trainer um, would handle something like a dog lunging at another dog, you know, uh, and where I think other trainers get it wrong, like balanced trainers get it wrong. I think the big mistake that I see in training when it, uh, who do use force is they are emotionally punishing the dog. And so they are therefore forgetting the simple concept of market, reinforce it, market, reinforce it. And I also think that they, they spend too much time in the punisher, you know, no, 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 no. And they sit there and hammer their point home as opposed to remembering that a proper correction is supposed to be a way to redirect, right? No, bunk, come sit, good, boom. And then there's food right there because the dog is tuned back in. So now they're sitting on command. Now the food is, is appropriate once again. Now they're downing on command. Now the food is appropriate once again. I feel like I, I have to tell uh, people who reach out to us all the time, um, there's nothing wrong with you creating a circumstance to reward the dog. It's fine. You know, but what if the dog lunged? Okay, well then correct it for the lunge, bring him over here, sit him down. Him. Okay, he just sat and he laid down. Where's the food at? You know, or the praise or the something, right? Like th there's got to be the flip side to that. So then if I've got a dog that is too scatterbrained on the walk and they just, you know, I, I also do believe, you know, and you can, you can uh, uh, disagree. Um, I also do believe that there are dogs who would greatly benefit in terms of their enjoyment of the walk by learning to settle down a little bit because they're just so frazzled all the time and, mm -hmm. and teaching a heel, which they don't need to be stuck in forever. Of course, it's just to teach them the skill set that they can realistically somewhat manage themselves on the walk to understand. You don't have to like die on every little hill that you see, right? Not every single squirrel is worth all of your attention. So teaching a heel, getting the dog to focus most of the time is easy. Most of the time you can get away with very little, if, if no corrections at all, right? It's just a matter of good, 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 right? And, and again, you can throw some engagement in there, sit, break, sit, break, just to, just, to, just to get it in. But then there's that thing where the dog's trigger comes around the corner, like you said. I mean, nobody can know, right? I live like a few blocks away from a school. Kids are loud. Kids are dumb. They, you know, they, they do stupid things. That... So sometimes I'll have a dog who's healing perfect. And then it's like, and even this right here, I'll, I'll address it like no heal, but I won't necessarily follow that verbal no with like a correction per se. Mm -hmm. But then there's something like, mur, mur, you know, and I'm like, ah, wait a minute now. Nope. Boom. And then the dog has this moment. like, Whoa, whoa. What was that? What? Sorry. But where trainers mess up is instead of piling on top of it, boom, boom, boom. No, 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 no. Which is what you're talking about, which is, is real. I think, I think uh, balanced trainers do do that, you know? then they start suppressing the outward behavior because then the dog is just afraid essentially to tell you how they're feeling, but they're still feeling. And because people, I don't know if it's the owner or the trainer, I've seen it both ways because they now don't see this outward behavior anymore. They think the dog's safe all of a sudden and they're like, Hey, come here, try to pet him. I want to see what he's going to do. And they do stupid <laughs> shit like that, you know? Right. And then the dog goes, Ugh! and then they act all surprised. And then they, yeah, call us, right? yeah it's like, so, you're, yeah, that's stupid. So, you know, I think the proper thing that good, good, good balance trainers that I'm seeing these days, not only do they talk about keeping your corrections in the scope of you're just redirecting, you need to get out of your damn feelings, correct the dog and then move on. If you're mad at the dog, you have a problem. And that problem isn't your recaller, right? Then once that's done, and then you've, you've now successfully redirected, now the dog's given you their attention, do something with it. And if you don't, that's your damn problem too, right? Mm -hmm. Once that's done, still, even if the dog is better, you still have to advocate for your dog. And the example that I give people all the time is my personal dog, who's actually, he's right here. His name is Simba. And Chubby I got, Simba. I know, my little, <laughs> my little chumba wumba. I got him, if you can see. Oh yeah, see. little guy. Yeah. Uh, I got just a butt, just a butt. I got him. I've had him what five, six years now, Brent. Something like that. I got him about uh, 
at 11 months old, he was a, a rescue from a, a mutual friend of ours who rescued him from a, a fighting situation. And he was legitimately one of the more challenging reactive dogs I've ever dealt with. Yep. You know, he was a dickhead. And he just happens to be my personal dog. Like, it seems like it works out that way with all of us, right? So he was actually a dog I learned e-collar on, by the way. I wasn't always a pro e-collar dog trainer. Um, and the, the, the what I explain to people is, my dog Simba, when I got him, you couldn't be near him. He went after me, went after my ex-girlfriend, went after my other dogs, went after every dog, kids, bikes, you name it. And if you corrected him, he would go after you for correcting him. Now... I comfortably, confidently know that I can have him around other dogs, other people, other this, other that. And he's very obedient, very compliant. However, and, and, and we're not talking corrections, but, you know, he's pretty much a cow these days. He just kind of like lumbers around and eats grass. So mm -hmm. I haven't really bothered putting an e-collar on him or like a prong collar or something in a good while, you know, I want to say almost like a month or so. Um, however, even though I'm very confident in him listening to me just verbally, I'm still not stupid enough or mean enough or whatever enough to just make him deal with all these other dogs. He can do it and he'll be good, mm -hmm. but he doesn't enjoy it. So why would I do that? I'm never going to take him to dog parks. I'm never going to take him to daycare. I never even force him to hang out with the other dogs outside. And I think more people need to have that sort of realistic understanding of like, look, if they don't like it, why, why is this such a sticking point for you? Why don't you just why don't you just yeah, walk is this your a dog deal breaker for right you? like yeah. why don't you just walk your dog the other six days of the week where the garbage truck isn't coming around you know or like or do it like a little bit later in the day or something like that you know that's actually another i sarah would you agree that's another common point between force free and balance force free trainers are very big on just advocate for your dog tell people yeah. to stay away mm -hmm. tell mm -hmm. your dog doesn't have to be sociable well, you can respect the nature of the dog yeah, I think the issue, I, 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 you know, as a trainer works, with, I mean, I work with a lot of pet dogs. I think the big thing is teaching people how to control or take charge or lead, you know, whatever verbiage you want to use. It's, it's this idea of like, like we as balanced dog trainers, like we are working with different tools because we're dealing with different people with different life scenarios, with different time frames, with all these different things. And, you know, if I have a client that I know with a puppy that I know for a fact, like, okay, this is, this is going to be a, like, a, like, these are going to be clients for a very long time. I can approach that in a very, all right, I'm going to teach you how to train your dog the way dog trainers train their dogs. Right. Because I know they have the time. I know they're going to pay attention. I know they're going to do the work. And you know, what, one of my clients is, uh, is his name's goose. He's uh, he has a, he has a oh, huge in Instagram following. And he was a guy that I said, all right, I'm going to teach you how to train your, this dog looks like a professional fucking dog trainer because I just taught him how to think. I taught, not what to think. I taught him how to think. And he was like, boom, boom, boom. So in those scenarios, I wish I had those opportunities with all my clients. And I wish owners cared to have that type of relationship, which is, I understand what you're talking about, Denise, when you're like, like I do it. Cause I like the, my connection. I like the way I'm able to do it. So is it, Go ahead. Is it on us, you guys, everybody? Is it on us as trainers to try to find a way to get the owners to care more? Yes, I think so. Okay. I think it is. And I think that, um, I think there's a lot to be thought about there. Um, I kind of got in a habit lately of teaching people and just explaining to them, this is what I want you to do and not explaining why. Mm -hmm. And then I realized it was because I had gotten a little, I, would, I don't even want to say lazy, but um, kind of yeah, unmotivated. Yeah, unmotivated of them being able to grasp those concepts and, and putting in that extra effort myself. And so um, I sat myself out of that because that's not the way I want to teach. I want to make sure that my students understand the reasons behind the methods that we're doing so that when they encounter another problem, maybe they can take that same concept and apply it to that problem and, and get ahead of it before they call me into it. Mm -hmm. um, that way I'm not fixing problems. Instead, I'm helping them. You know, it's like that old say, saying, um, you can teach it or you can give a man a fish or you can teach him to fish or, and, him or to whatever. Fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, like why wouldn't we want pet owners or sport dog competitors to know those reasons behind and why wouldn't we take that extra effort to teach it um, and, and just get ahead of all this stuff to begin with? I'm just going to play devil's advocate here because I agree with you, okay? 
whenever I've heard the whenever I've heard the argument, not necessarily against it, but just more toward the very simplified, very streamlined methods of training, like, like the two week thing online, you know, is owners like simple owners are kind of like consumers, they just want to know, like, you know, how much is it? What's it going to do for me, blah, blah, blah. So they just need to know what they need to know type thing. Yeah, but okay, fine and dandy, but you can always simplify these things down. It's not hard. So when I taught pet classes, they, I was the They oh, want convenience, maybe not simple. Yeah, convenience. yeah, okay, that's yeah. fine, but it's Sorry, not to break your point. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> can we just agree that, that those trainers that are saying two weeks that Yeah. What the hell? Like can we just yeah. Oh, you have no idea. I've 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 rattled on about these people i, th I think now, you had. i, I, I we have you, to we have to make but, it we have a, we but, have to make a okay, um, go ahead can, before we get back on that i just i just want to pull them out of the conversation just like we pull out force free trainers that mm -hmm. that um you are so extreme on that extreme like mm -hmm. why do they have any relevance in this conversation I'll, I'll tell you why um because i'm the one who brought them up so so, so sorry for the stress the, uh, no, I'm just... <laughs> so so here's why because it's a it's a personal example because I moved to Arizona a couple years ago and when I moved here of course new state no client base I was applying at kennels to hold myself over while I built a client base these people were one of the uh, companies that I applied for you know once I met them and had the opportunity to like sit and talk with them I was like oh you guys are kind of nuts uh, so I didn't end up working with them but they also just so happen to be, I think still to this day, I can look really quick, the uh, most reviews, highest rated on, on Google, like of, of this area here. So That's clients why. don't necessarily not know what they don't know. Did I say that the right way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. They don't always right. know. The, the one thing, again, this gets down to that pet sport dog split. With pet dog owners, I'm probably a little more simplistic. But that doesn't mean, I mean, I'm going to talk about things like, look, I really want the dog to want to be with you more than anything. So that's about, I talk that way. And then these are the specific skills. But with sport dog people, I want to teach them how to train dogs. Mm -hmm. And I do approach it differently. And the very first thing I would do with a sport dog trainer was a shaping exercise. I had a few I could choose from, a retrieve or get on a platform. And the reason I would do it is because if you do that with a dog, after a few minutes, the dog does this thing where they offer behavior and then they go like that. They look at you and they mm -hmm. say, is that right? Mm -hmm. And it's an unrec It's so unmistakable, the sentient reality of that being. And I want the owners to see that because time and time again, I would see owners kind of go like, like they didn't know dogs had that expression. They didn't know dogs could ask you that question. Did I get it right? <laughs> So, so my, my thing is, and what I was trying to get to is mm -hmm. that why not do that in the pet dog classes? When I taught pet dog classes, they always learned how to shape. It wasn't the only method they learned. They learned luring, they learned recalls, they learned everything else, but I taught them how to shape and why it was relevant. Mm -hmm. And they had that same light bulb moment of, oh my God, my dog is so smart. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a complicated behavior. It was go to a mat. Like right. you no, can and, shape, and, go to a mat. No, and, so, and, like, and go ahead. I'm so sorry. I, I think this just comes back to the whole, why can't we give the owners more credit? It, explanation, but hold on. Anyway, your, sorry, your, on. Your, your, sig your signal's chopping up. Can you say what you just said again? Okay. Go ahead. I was just saying again that it, it just comes down to giving those antlers, a, those, God, I can't talk anymore, the owner a little bit more credit and like, giving them a little bit more information than just do this A, B, and C. No, I, yeah. I totally agree with you. So I was kind of playing devil's advocate for a reason, because given that I'm pretty sure we're all on the same page with that, how? Because again, I, now I see now I'm going to bring it back to confidence. Boom. You know, Sarah Bruschi can explain to an owner all day long, right? Brent Labrada can explain to an owner all day long. Denise Fenzi can explain to an owner all day long. So can I? newer trainers, or even if they're not newer, but just haven't necessarily have to have that, that conversation just yet. I'm asking like functionally, how do, how do we for go about making this easier for trainers in the future to make sure owners understand, like, listen, you, you got the dog. This is now your responsibility to do the work with this dog. You can't, you don't get to be Mr. Lazy convenient anymore. You know, I, I realize you're busy and you have a job and a life and everything else. And I get that. Like Denise was talking about, there's a balance to things. Right. You do like the rights where you have a right to have your life. I get it. 
but your dog has a right to enjoy their life too. They're not Dobby that's going to run around and do everything you want them to do. So how, you know, how do we go about making this better in the future? Is it just more of these conversations? Is it finding ways to describe things and then sharing it with other trainers? Like, that's what I'm trying to get at. I think sharing those metaphors and sharing those explanations with other trainers is huge. And I think this is where a lot of that mentorship um, comes in handy or partnership. So mm. getting together with other trainers regularly and bouncing off ideas, we can share the same concepts left, right, every single day, but the way we're sharing those concepts is always different. And yeah. I know when I attend other people's seminars or lectures or talks, other trainers, I always come away with a new way to explain things. And that is why I go. I know that the people I'm learning from share the same ideas, mm -hmm. but because they share those same ideas, they have a different way of explaining them. And so that's my job as a trainer is to find those best ways to communicate. And that means going and learning mm -hmm. online from another instructor or just going and chatting or listening to 5,000 podcasts like I do, or mm -hmm. getting on another social media platform and just doing the time and my knowledge that way that's what you have to do yeah i yeah. do find that child analogies work quite well mm -hmm. Me too. Uh, i spend a lot of time talking to people about you know if this was a kid what were your expectations do you, and, do you ever run into a client who has no clue what you're talking about like oh well like with, it, with, the child, with the child analogies yeah, yeah well dog trainers well, don't well, believe in children oh oh <laughs> Well, I don't know yet. Um, what was I going to say? The, the I like take that personally right now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dude, sometimes I'll have a client and I'll give like an example from childhood. And I just missed, I missed completely. Just, I was just like, you know, when your mom gave you a bedtime and they'll be like, yeah. I have, I was an orphan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, oh right. no. Right. Oh, that's dark. Whoops. But that, but that's true. Yeah. I was a, I never knew my father. I yeah. never knew my father. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, his little flippers are like this. I know. I never oh, knew my father. Father. <laughs> Finding Nemo, Finding Nemo reference. Um, okay, uh, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna go. So, so where do, where do we disagree again? Where do we disagree? Almost nowhere. You know, that's <laughs> no. the funny thing is, it's almost nowhere. And and we, well, we the did, thing we, is, you're talking to two people who are open minded. Who, yeah. Well, it's more than that. It's just. I think we just see it differently. We're coming from right. different places. We aren't working with pet clients true, as much. True. We're working. Um, we, I don't, are you a crossover trainer, Sarah? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that makes a difference. It does mean that I don't think you're all evil, horrible people. Cause that would mean I, I was an evil, horrible, you know, yeah. uh, I don't think I was a bad person. I don't think I was mean. I just think I had different ideas. Yeah. Um, I, one question I, I do have, um, do you think that balanced trainers would agree that a no force option is better than a force option, all other things being equal? Yeah. If, 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 yeah, if all of the things were equal, then why not? Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm asking because sometimes I hear things and see what's things a, what's that it's not clear what's to an me. Example, what's an example? Cause I'm, I'm, I'm just going to try and think of an example. Maybe. All I'm, right. A prong collar. I want to run it through a, my head through a bunch of a prong collar or a front clip harness. Are those basically equal? And if, if they got the exact same if, outcome. Yeah, if they yeah. have the I mean, if you're using same... it for loose leash walking, not for correcting the dog to do anything. If you're just using right. that, then... So that would be an example of something I would yeah. encourage balanced trainers to rethink why they put prong collars on dogs when mm -hmm. maybe they could use a front clip. Which isn't even saying I'm right. I'm just saying that... Right, you know, right, right, right. That, and, and, and I would say, and I would say modern, modern day, again... We don't necessarily even consider ourselves balanced dog trainer. It's just the category we get thrown in, yeah. right? Yeah. It just it's I, I would say, I would say in the context of if there are other behaviors, like so if I have a reactive dog where I might need to have a little bit more control over their worst behavior, right. then I would have to look at what tool gives me optimum uh con the physical control over the animal, yes. right? Yes, um, right. So then a harness those, is not right. Then a harness is not gonna be right because the dog will just be spinning around. And if I have any issues with aggression, you know, there in those contexts, mm -hmm. yes. But if it's just sweet little puppy, nothing wrong going on, but, yes, you shouldn't be slapping a pinch collar on a little tiny puppy who could do it on a slip lead or a front clip harness or whatever. But I, I also wanted to ask answer the question as as it was asked, which was like mm -hmm. if all things are equal, then yeah. 
Yes. So like, for example, then let, let's go back. I'm, to I'm that having set. trouble. The whole equal part. I'm trying well, to okay. Say. Well, let, here, let me, let me paint the picture. Denise, everything in my head is contextual. <laughs> Denise or Sarah, you tell me if I'm getting this wrong. Okay. So here's my example of all things equal. We have this dog. Mm -hmm. um, dog doesn't have any outstanding issue of any sort, but they pull, they, let's say they jump, let's say the recall is not great, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. simple stuff. Mm -hmm. You could throw a prong collar on because, because, uh, I agree with Brent that prong collars offer a little more information, directional pressure, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. However, if all things are equal, then that means this dog could be trained on a harness with other means. What about more food? What about more toys? What about more wood? And we would, we would eventually come to the exact same outcome, same level of training. Mm -hmm. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, think, yeah. I think so. I mean, I think it's something I would want to see balance trainers start thinking about before they apply an aversive, just ask themselves, right. is there an alternative that works equally well to solve yeah. this particular problem? Yeah. I think we can tell you from the balance trainers or, you know, the balance trainer side of things that Brent and I have, have really had our issues with even being even being lumped in. Like I say, I'm a balanced trainer just because it's like the identifiable thing, you know, like yeah. somebody can, somebody can just kind of quickly figure out what I'm saying, just in the, just in the, uh, in the essence of being efficient for time, I guess, but balanced training has become such this broad thing. And half of these balanced trainers give the rest of us a bad name. Yes. And I would say, I would say also a lot of the arguments are literally direct responses to being called abusive and being called this. So it's like, it's like, 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 what are, like, what are we going to tell us talk? Like, what shit can you talk about the force free world? Okay. You guys are a bunch of idealists. You guys are, um, you guys are dreaming. You guys don't understand control. You don't understand how humans or how animals actually work when it comes to control and all this stuff. Well, so, people say it's ineffective. It's too slow. It's, it's too uh, slow. That dog's gonna die, right? That dog's gonna die. If oh, that's a big one. That's it, a, yeah. Right? That's a big one. Is 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 um. Yep. I hear that one a lot. Is like, well, I met with this lady who you know she doesn't believe in like prong collar, e collar, or something. You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and she told me flat out, like before even working with the dog, that that like this dog is is beyond help type thing. Wow. I, I hear that one all the time. So people time. come to you saying that about all the time. It, it's almost, is it's there like a specific a, trainer they're referring to? Like, is it, a person it happened you know? in LA? It happens here. So like on top of untamed, on top of my business here, I'm, I'm an executive board member for the Phoenix Metro Chamber Foundation. So I work with like 70 something rescues, you know, so I get this conversation probably daily, if not more. Um, and it, it's, it kind of becomes like a running joke, right? Brand up like, oh, I've trained, I've trained however many untrainable right. dogs, like, right, you know, right, 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 um, right. yeah, I, I get it quite. I, I literally had this conversation today's Wednesday. I had it yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, this lady came to us at our latest pet adoption event, which was like a couple weeks ago on Saturday. And the, she did not bring the dog. She was talking to us about the dog. Uh, 70 pound pity. The dog's name is Bethany. She's a female. This crazy history was left emaciated, poor thing in a covered in her own, like piss and everything in, in a crate in an, an abandoned apartment. Mm -hmm. Um, now the dog is, is healthy and big and strong and happier and all this good stuff, but very reactive on the leash, very reactive and lunges at people when they come in the house, mm -hmm. you know, and all this good stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, this lady and I, uh, were talking about this and she she was telling me that she had met with two trainers. Both of them told her, like, just give it up. And wow. one of so, them didn't even work the dog or try to work the dog. So just like you just said that balance trainers, you guys just use that name out of convenience because that's kind of the best fit. It's the same thing for force free. Okay. So, mm -hmm we call force free because what else are we supposed to call ourselves as a quick reference, whatever, but sure. there are people on the other end of the spectrum that give us a bad name as well. And mm -hmm. so somebody who has the ego to say this dog is untrainable because I can't train this dog. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not a relevant comment at all. And right. that's so sad to me, whatever mm -hmm. methods that trainers using, whether they're balanced or not, that they think that they are the only one in the world that can make that judgment call and mm -hmm. call a dog right. untrainable. Mm -hmm. that, that's not okay. Why would to reach out for a second opinion in my opinion or if somebody came to me and i couldn't fix a problem i was going to say i don't i can't do this here is a reference for another trainer who might be able to help you refer mm -hmm. them have that ne network of trainers yeah. of all methods that you can call upon that you agree on certain things and that specialize mm -hmm. in certain cases no and, and I, so 
I mean, you can't, you can't, I understand you're playing devil's advocate and everything else, but at the same time, just like you weren't, just like you use that excuse of balanced trainers because they're being called abusive, whatever. Mm. Well, we're not really balanced. You know, that's just the term we're using. It's the same thing for most of the force free mm. positive reinforcement, whatever trainers out there. Mm. Yeah. That's great that um, those trainers at the front of the spectrum can't train your dog and say that there's dogs that are untrainable and sending dogs to their mm. death, but that's not the majority of us. No. And I, so right, right. that's I figured kind of just that. the thing to remember. No, I figured oh, that and it was actually, it was actually you that made me aware of that. What last time we spoke, that was, that I didn't realize there was this much like there's always like the civil war within the uh, balanced community. I, I knew that maybe just because I'm closer to it, but I didn't know that there was that much disagreement uh, within the, uh, you know, force. free oh, Yeah. Community. Yeah. Because how do you define uh, within the force free community? Nobody calls ourselves purely positive because that's impossible. Right. That's, right, right, that's right. usually only used as a disparaging marketing, term. Marketing. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we don't even. Uh, balanced traders call us that. We don't call ourselves that. <laughs> mm. but, okay. But we don't what, know what to call you guys. That's interesting yeah, to no, know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's actually an insult. Mm. It's okay. Dog <laughs> trainers. Just it's, call us it's, all it's dog derog- trainers. It's derogatory? It's derogatory. Uh, <laughs> reinforcement based is your safest, is your face the safest to go because there is no such thing as force free. There's no such thing as purely positive and we know it. Uh-huh. But within the spectrum, there are people like me who I think I'm actually on the balanced side, just because, like I said, I will stop behavior, even if it's right. inconvenient to my dog. And I do absolutely give weight to society and other people in the family. Mm-hmm. I just choose, I don't use certain tools and I really try to minimize those choices, you know, mm-hmm. philosophically. Mm-hmm. And there are people who, I don't know if they really mean it, but they say they never say no to their dogs. I don't know. I'm just not that good in life. I, I'm not I that good. Maybe know. they are. I, I mean, that's impressive if they are, and that's super, but I, I mean, I'm maybe not. they have really b- bad behaved dogs, but I don't know. I, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is that you don't have to say no, you really don't. I, when I'm at my best training, I'm yeah. training, not telling my dogs to stop doing things. It's just that I get tired yeah, <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, for yeah, lack yeah. of a better answer. That's why I, you know, but just so you know this, cause you may already know it. Mm-hmm. The force free trainers often say that they get the dogs from balanced trainers that were made much worse. Oh, right. So now they yeah. have to backtrack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and I remember I, I said that once to a balanced trainer and they were surprised. They were unaware that it actually goes both other ways. Way. Mm-hmm. And so my question is, regardless of what format of train or whatever, wherever, whatever, you, wherever part, part of the spectrum you start on, is it possible that the recipe for that crossover client that goes from balance to pure positive or pure positive to, sorry, derogatory terms. Yeah, I, hear you. <laughs> I don't but, care. But I know, I'm just joking. Uh, but those, the crossover client that goes to a different type of trainer, is it possible also they may not have either sat well with the work in general, whether it was sat well with the amount of time and repetitions, maybe uh, a more positive R plus discipline required from them and they're actually giving a shit and spending time with the dog and going through their exercises, or perhaps they were turned off by a remote because I've had a client that straight sure. up was dog aggressive, old woman, 70 years old. I said, this dog is going to do e-collar because you are not physically strong enough to handle this to dog. To hold him, right. Head halty, nothing won't work. Yeah. So we do, we teach her on the e-collar, her timing's horrible, all this stuff. And instead of continuing to do more lessons, she just insists on like, no, it doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. And I'm over here like, no, look, look at me crossing 10 other dogs because she didn't want to push the button. Right. Do you right. get what I'm saying? And so you, if you hire, you know, if you hire me, you have to also do what the trainer says. And is right. that the is that the the fault of the trainer, right? If there's bad education and bad foundation, yes, that is the fault of the trainer. But at the end of the day, if a client just doesn't want to put the work in, regardless of what side you're on, it, you're you're fucked. The dog is fucked. Right. Yeah, but- or maybe the client didn't get along with the trainer, or maybe the trainer wasn't sure. very skilled and right. couldn't do the training, or mm. maybe the trainer or the handler just didn't want to train the dog. There's so many different variables that it's not just just the method. The method is just one tiny little variable that's going to impact that client's decision. Mm-hmm. And so you can't say, well, that client was with a force-free trainer. Yeah, but it could have been a force-free trainer who is 16 years old doing this as a part-time right. gig. Right. Like, mm-hmm. what does that even mean? Why are the labels are what kills yeah. me with these conversations? Yeah. They're dog trainers. So they went from this one dog trainer who they didn't mesh with for whatever reason, the product trainer. wasn't done to another dog trainer who has better success. Mm-hmm. Period. And and to and to and we again, don't know the reason why. 
you know, you're totally right. And to, and to kind of uh, add on to that point, you know, and I extend another, I guess, olive branch. Uh, I'm having a dog come in, in about three days. And the story of this dog is, oh, this is what I was telling you about, Brent. So mm-hmm. I've got a 17 year old kid who's in a wheelchair. Oh, this is dope. He's going to be in a wheelchair forever. And I have to check on a dog. I'll be right back. Okay. And um, he's got himself a two year old uh, golden mix. And he, this kid is 17 in a wheelchair. He taught his dog how to open doors for him, how to retrieve things for him, like specific things that he can ask for. He taught him so much that when he emailed the website asking about training, I was like, why do you need training? You know, and I call them and everything else. I come to the house for the eval and he, the issues that he struggles with are, were compounded by a poor experience with an e-collar board and trade program. And so the dog pulls because he's a goal. He's excited. He wants to see people say hello. He's very sweet. And like, and he's very driven and he's big at that. Cause I went and met with him, you know, um, he pulls, he jumps, he barks, he this and that. Um, and so they sent him to a, a board and train. I forget how long, I think it was like three weeks, two or three weeks. And the dog came back afraid of his e-collar much worse in the crate than he was when he went and had a host of other, he, he, he had like the shutdown problem. You know, you push the button and immediate down, you know? And so they're looking for training because the dog still pulls and everything else when they're out and about, and he needs him to be, you know, a well-behaved dog so he can walk around with him and have him like push the doors to open stuff for him and all that good stuff. Right. Um, so then they're calling around and, and they're understandably skeptical and guarded and everything else. So I go and do the eval and I talk to them about what most likely could have gone wrong. And, you know, and I was like, it's hard to say. And, and I was trying to, I, I was trying to make it a point to be like, listen, I'm not slamming this guy. I have no idea what happened. I'm not going to act like I know, you know, I have no idea what happened for all I know. They're like, they're telling me a story like, you know, so I'm just not going to take a stance there, you know? What I told him instead was like, listen, this is what I do know. I do know that when you're working with tools like e-collars, they can be very beneficial with the right foundational setup. They have to be on point in terms of timing and intensity. Like e-collars are really high level tools in the good and bad sense in that they can get you a lot of like finicky stuff, like off leash long recalls and all that good stuff. But they're also high level in the sense that it's not just like a pick up and go type thing. You have to know what you're doing and the dog has to know what they're doing. And you know, I was going over some other stuff, learned helplessness and why I want to avoid that and everything else. And, you know, and how to not have these, these issues with the crate and the pulling and all that good stuff. Um, but the kids in a wheelchair, I, I'm still going to do the e-collar, but I, you know, he, this wouldn't be the first dog that I've had to recondition with an e-collar to get them comfortable so that they can then do their job, you know? Yeah. And, you know, realistically that first trainer will never know. Yeah, I mean, the right. odds, they think they had a successful client and, yeah. They don't have the feedback. You know what? It just so happens that this this guy, from what they told me, again, this is just what they told me. I don't know if this is true. Yeah. Actually, has like has like charges brought against him from other clients and stuff like that now. So okay. So you know. So yeah. So abusive. I, yeah, so right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um. You know. But my my point being, we get that from other balanced trainers as well. Right. It's not like it's not like every dog that needs to be retrained is is like some dog from like an R plus trainer. Uh, I've retrained so many balanced dogs. I've retrained dogs yeah. that have, I've retrained a couple Huskies that went to Caesar. Like it, it really just all depends, you know? Yeah. And, this is actually in Sarah's point is good. We're dog trainers. It's right. there's good trainers and there's bad trainers. That's just yeah. the way it is. It should be yeah. good or bad. Yeah. Not what well, methods you use. That's yeah, why like, I was bringing it up. I wanted to extend that olive branch of like, it's not, it's not like it's just, this doesn't work. So I tried that. Sometimes it's like, this would have worked only you fucked it up, you yeah. know? And then I'll have to go back and, and redo it the right way, you know? That's a great point. I hadn't even really thought about it because all I hear is the crossing over the, and frankly, most clients don't know anything about any of that. So if that's the case, they just pick another trainer. But it is discouraging that first trainers often haven't got a clue that they failed or made it worse. Maybe they wouldn't care. I don't know, but you know, they don't know. No. And, and, and I feel bad for the owner because this guy, he, he's so, he's so cool. When I was at the eval, I made a joke to him. He's 17, mind you. And he taught his dog all this stuff. And I was like, man, like you're legit, you know? Yeah. And he's such like a sweet kid. I think he's like, well, thank you. You know? And, and I was like, why? Like, you should just be a dog trainer. You know, I, I was, I was kind of joking, like, you know, and his mom immediately dives in like, well, actually he's wanted to be a dog trainer forever. And it's just, you know, oh. with the wheelchair and it, Doesn't so, matter. 
Well, long story short, I hired him, but, but, you know, but, but it was, yeah, that's, what, oh, that's where the story went. That's awesome. But, um, but, but my, my, my point in it was just, um, there are, there are too many examples of like, the tool was fine. You messed up. And even if the tool was fine, and even if the method was fine, the timing was off and the right thing done at the wrong time is the wrong thing. Right. And so we were getting into all that stuff and I was trying to get him to understand everything because you were talking about like, you know, simplifying down enough that they kind of get it. He's not a trainer, except in his particular case, he had to know enough to be solid, like solid enough that you can control this big, excitable golden from a wheelchair, you know? So that's kind of how the conversation like slowly shifted into like, Oh, you want to be a dog trainer? Okay. You know, let's see what you can do. Um, but yeah, I mean, reconditioning dogs that have been working on potentially the tool that would end up being the right tool for them, but it was done the wrong way happens more than you would think, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't want you guys to feel like it's, it's more like me saying, you know, I don't think very highly of the trainers that well, the one that didn't even work with that one pity Mm -hmm. and were like, just, you know, I don't really care what method they work with. I just think that that's stupid. Like you didn't even give it a shot. Yeah. I want to, I want to talk about something. um, Something I learned from, the R plus world, right? And, and is scaffolding, shaping, close approximations, um, you know, a lot of that type of stuff. And this is this is something that that I used just the other day. 120 pound German Shepherd. He's only like 10, 11 months. He's a beast, a beast of a boy, right? From from a European country, but it's not Germany. Um, and the dog has had leash reactivity since he was five months old and the dog's now like 11 months old. Right. And it's so funny because she comes in on, on a harness, right. And this dog on a back clip harness and the dog is just just like a protection dog. Right. And I want to see, you know, there's different variations of leash reactivity that you see. So some of them are just like, I want to play. Some of them are just like, fuck that dog. Some of them, it's only the small dog. Some of them, it's the big dogs, right? So there's a bunch of different types. And so I see this and I'm trying to see, you know, I bring one dog out, great, uh, reactive, calmed him down. But what I started seeing was I started seeing, he's, the dog started showing me the different formats and modules that other trainers have tried with him. So he started like checking in, Mm -hmm. he started doing all, you know, all this work. And I'm just like, you've developed this, right? He goes, yeah, I've been to three trainers. And I said, okay. So what I realized is there was three, like, like the dog was, uh, the dog was completely desensitized to prongs, right? Completely desensitized to a leash correction. But what I did start seeing is that the, the, the counter conditioning work, the checking in stuff started being developed really well. So I saw that. So then what I ended up doing is I put the dog on an e-collar because he wasn't desensitized to that. I gave one correction, small, low level, just something annoying where he's like, what is that? Hmm. And I rewarded. And I, then I was able to bring four or five dogs out and he wasn't super suppressed. I was just controlling that time that he would start it up. But then the old conditioning of checking in for food kicked in. So then I said, that's what was missing. You were just so desensitized to just, I just needed to give you this little aversive to say, cut that shit out, but in a way that felt different for him. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to condition the rest of it, you know, 10 reps, just food, 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 food. And then it got to this point where he's laying down, relaxing by all these other dogs and literally kid you not only two, maybe three corrections at low level stimulation. You know what I mean? And so, but I was able to pick up on some of the other formats that other trainers have tried, right? right. And I didn't have to develop it. So I, it made me look really good at my job. Just, yeah. just that little scenario. So long story short, she's signing up for a six week program, right? Excellent. She's signing up for a six week program. But, but the idea is, is it's not, you know, it's hard because I see that there are lots of good dog trainers and there's so much good stuff out there. And sometimes it takes an educator, Right? It mm-hmm. takes it takes someone like me, someone like you, someone like Sarah, someone like Mariana, someone like Michael Ellis, someone to put it all together. Because you know, what are we arguing about? Are we arguing about the commands that we're developing? No, but sometimes we're arguing about does this ha- happen before this or does this happen before that? And all of that is context based. So 
Go ahead. It's funny because without the context, pretty much the answer to all of it is like, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> depends. depends. So, yeah, I mean, no, I agree with you. I, I really, I, I agree with, you know, what are, what are the big, so from the, from the R plus world, what is the, the big, like, I don't know, not questions, but like, or yeah, questions. Are there any questions or like, like myth busting or something? I love myth busters. Yeah. That you guys have <laughs> for us. I mean, cause I think you guys have a pretty good, you guys surround yourself with enough balanced trainers to kind of have a good grasp on it. But if there are any people who are on the R plus side that could learn something from the R plus world. And obviously there's so much that I've, that we've, we've talked about on many episodes of this podcast of mm-hmm. all the stuff you, that we've learned personally mm-hmm. from, from the pure positive or from the, <laughs> from the R plus world. R plus. Yeah. R plus. Um, are there any questions or, or myth busting you guys want to talk about or ask? I think that in my mind, the thing that stands out for me that force free trainers really could learn from the balanced community is when structure is a better answer than choice, because we go to choice so fast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think many of our dogs become anxious as a result. I'm mm-hmm. using many sort of broadly. I'm just saying mm-hmm that recognizing that some dogs need more structure because we're always talking about choice, more choice, more choice, more. And I just, I think maybe we're losing our center a little bit. And the thing, um, I, I do think that's a really important, um, just a skill for people to develop and to be aware of and to understand. We do use place and all that kind of stuff. But I think the, the overall structure of the life of the dog in some cases, without going into a nothing in life and free kind of an approach, um, has, has value. Uh, and I don't know that it's well known and I have talked about it and often it's not met with the most enthusiastic response because so we what are is, in a choice phase. Can, can you, so then can you explain this for me? So the, I, so obviously dogs, you know, at my career now, I definitely do remember like dogs don't know, like children, they don't know any better. You got to tell them what to do. You got to structure them. You can't let them do anything by themselves. And then I've learned like how that sucks. Right over time what is the argument for you have to have choice all the time Um, well they wouldn't say that but what they would say is the more choice you give a learner the animal the happier the learner is like Mm -hmm. when they kind of look at sort of studies and the brain and chemicals Mm -hmm. and hormones and all that having choice over your life is actually a really big deal so you may know that as a self-employed person the difference between working for yourself and choosing your hours and all you work way longer and way harder Mm -hmm. than you do if you work for somebody else. So having control over your destiny is a big, big deal. And it's true Mm -hmm. for animals too, like Mm -hmm. in zoos Mm -hmm. and stuff. So the combination of enrichment to improve an animal's quality of life and giving them choice over that is a big deal because of quality of life. And I, Mm -hmm. I think that's correct. I don't, I actually don't think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that these things need to take place maybe within a context of more structure Mm -hmm. and that, by adding more structure, um, we can in some cases just improve, especially if the dog has uh, behavior issues like anxiety or fear, sometimes telling them what to do is the kindest thing because they're not in a place to make a decision and they don't want to. Correct. That direction and techniques around that I think would be quite beneficial. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Denise. I've heard, I've heard this was related to humans, by the way. I, I heard that uh, choice, of, uh, of course, is is the optimal like solution as opposed to like being forced into something. Mm -hmm. However, I have, I have heard, and I can't remember the study uh, that choice does have diminishing returns. Like a human is happier choosing from like four flavors of ice cream as opposed to like 400 Mm -hmm. because then they're just, because then they're torn. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, in dog training, the way that I personally Mm -hmm. look at these things um, is I agree with you that dogs should make choices and have like, I want dogs to have as much freedoms as they can, as they know what to do with right without it becoming a negative that's pretty right. much how i phrase it like almost word for word to clients and my trainers and everything else uh then with that in mind i give them enough structure to remove any bad options meaning right. if you know meaning if i take my personal dogs on a walk i believe in teaching a tight solid heel but it's not a forever thing it's to teach the heel it's to teach the benefit of learning how to heal then you can kind of back off of the heel. So like my personal dogs, they don't walk in heel. They just walk around, you know, if I see dogs coming, I'll throw them in heel while we pass the dogs, you know, then release them. Um, And same thing goes for other things. Like I know Caesar did the whole exercise, discipline, affection. I tell clients, you can do all three at once, make a structured game, 
if my dog loves to run around and do his thing and he's an e-collar trained dog, so I can, I can safely take him in places and do it. I can give him exercise discipline and affection with something as easy as fetch, you know, go get it. Good boy. Good boy. Sit good. Go get it. You know, and he can be doing all three things at once, but by the nature of the game, it's not, a, you know, it's not a dog park. It's not a busy street. It's not a something I'm slowly kind of removing down options. And if I'm throwing the ball and this rarely happens to me, but I'll be throwing a ball. And like the, the thing I, I'm worried about the most now when I'm like off leash fetching my dogs is other people's dogs, you know, and I'll see the ball bouncing. My dog goes to get it. And then I see the one, I see this in the distance and I'm like, Oh shit, Simba come, you know, and, yeah. and, and I'll, I'll work that recall. So I will kind of limit him down in a sense, but it, it's just enough that you cannot make a mistake in this little bubble that I've created for you. But, but I, but I notice that the better the dogs get, the bigger that bubble becomes. And so they'll get their choices back. And that's something I tell clients all the time too, is, understand that the reason why training is is beneficial is because in a sense it's my job to stress the dog a little bit not not because of anything other than just learning and changing is stressful even if there was no force at all you, I'm, I'm you know rebuilding yeah. habits and that's not an easy thing that being said it's it's a little easier for the dog to kind of get into the groove if there's a decent amount of momentum which is why something like a board and train is highly successful because you can totally overhaul the dog's day to day now when the dog goes back home to you, I'm going to have you emulate a little more closely to the board and train. It's going to be a little more structure, a little more this, a little more that up front. And then slowly, we're going to make your bubble bigger so that your dog knows how to make decisions here and then here and then here and then here without making the mistakes. Because I think that when we talk about owners being lazy, they throw too much too soon back at the dog. And they're like, oh, well, you know, that dog aggressive dog. I took him to the dog park yesterday and he bit my aunt, you know? So <laughs> what's your you, aunt doing at the dog park? Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I do believe that like kind of corralling the dog down, giving them choice, but limited ish choice is, is like the, the, the current modern, like balanced trainers ideals of how this stuff works. And then as the dog gets better, you make, you, you broaden out the choices. Yeah, I would, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, that's totally reasonable to me. I think limited choice is fine. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what are some other things? What are some other things like Go ahead, some, sir. some gripes? I completely agree with what you're saying as far as limiting the choices and expanding the dog's bubble. And that was a really great analogy, I thought, on that part and very similar to how I approach training. Mm -hmm. um, but the question I have, and I hope it's okay, guys, that I ask yeah. this question, yeah, even yeah. though I'm not a, ho a host. Um, do you think that um, balanced trainers build a more resilient dog overall than force free trainers. And mm. this is for all three of you. I like you, Sarah. So I'm going to be straight up. I, you know, I, I almost, almost, almost made the mistake of, of like trying to play the, the like diplomatic wordy game. Mm -hmm. So instead I'm just going to keep it real. The more resilient. Yes. Right. There's a reason why I personally choose to work with these sorts of tools. Mm -hmm. However, um, I see this pitfall with balance training infinitely more than I see with positive, uh, like with R plus training. The tool that was supposed to make the dog more resilient ended up being a crutch. And the dog is good when the collar's on, mm -hmm. but not when the collar's off. So so maybe kind of no, but, but overall, the reason why I say yes is because kind of to Brent's point, resilient in the sense that we can do it, can the owner. So overall, I, I would I would say yes. That's interesting. So you're seeing resilient in the term of the behavior. The behavior is the strong part and it's the behavior holding up. Is that correct? Yes. I'm taking resilient to mean consistent. Unless, now what unless... about the dog as the dog as a whole? And by resilient, I mean that dog's ability to handle challenges in their daily life. Mm, okay. Um, and, and, and I would think, well, here's the thing is I would also say all of this is based on what the issues are what are the dogs like what is what is the dog's daily life in general like is this a dog going hiking and going a bunch of places and needs lots of socialization is this a dog that's going to be a house pet and just live in the house yeah but but in, in fairness i'm sure sarah's asking the the same sort of question like all mm -hmm. other things equal mm -hmm. right like we're not gonna we're not gonna put up like a really hyper nervous dog versus correct like, Right. So, so the same dog, the same dog being raised uh, force free and not having the added stress of uh, tools and corrections being applied, mm. um, would they be able to handle 
challenges in their environment or challenges with their relationship with their owner or challenges with other dogs the same. Do you think that your use of tools adds a certain some minor level and I'm saying your guys is so a, a good e collar trainer, not yep. not somebody at the far far end because we're sure. just excluding them from our conversation. <laughs> um, does that create a, a stronger dog overall in their daily life? I because they're getting exposed to those little bits of stress um, at a, a mediocre level. I, I personally do believe so for that reason, because I, I do believe that um, whatever the reason for applying the stress aside, I do think that it's it's good for dogs and healthy for dogs to learn how to deal with stress, even if you're the one who's applying it. Now, of course, you don't do it needlessly. I'm not saying you just go out and correct a dog just so that they learn how to get over it. But I, I, I do think that if you're working appropriate training, naturally, just by the very nature of training, it can be stressful, like in its little, in, in doses that are bite-sized enough to be beneficial for the dog, right? Because I think that has diminishing returns too, stress, right? But I do think that overall in the real world, the dog is more than likely going to come across some sort of situation to where they're going to have to deal with stress, just the very nature of being stressed out themselves. And they need to know what to do under stress or what not to do at the very least. Yeah, I think that really makes sense. My, so my thought is, is that's easier for a balance trainer to do. And there would be a lot of information there for uh, our plus the other side, the other side, we'll just call it the other side, to take a little bit of a lesson from that. That's my because favorite I do believe song. that there's the, <laughs> um, the other side. I do believe, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I Go believe ahead. there's a lot of value for building resilience in pet dogs and, and sport dogs as well. And mm -hmm. I think that's an area that's really lacking on the, on the force free side, the R plus side. Mm -hmm. um, we're really concerned about keeping our dogs stress levels down, but then when they encounter stress in their daily lives, mm -hmm. a lot of them are lacking that, that ability to go, Oh, this to is cope. a challenge. I can overcome this and, and to cope on it. And so I, I wish that more, I wish there was an easier way to help build that resilience without the use of corrections and, and tools. I don't know, Denise, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't because I don't have enough experience with balanced. I, I don't have a good point of reference to compare. I will say that I think balanced training does create a handler harder dog. So a dog who's more resistant to their handler, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the protection sports. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm, I think, mm -hmm. whereas I think a plus R dog is uh, more handler sensitive. Mm -hmm. and more uh willing more and able to, in a way yeah well it, because you're on the same team whereas mm -hmm. sometimes if you're using tools you're not the, it's the dog against you and the decoy mm -hmm. and i think in the oh world, but i i would i want to jump to the balance trainers defense on this because i'm talking about those balance trainers that use those tools in a way that isn't at that fine, fine level. And I, and I want to yeah. defend them here that no, I don't believe that it's the handler versus the dog in 90% of those high level protection sport teams. I'm going to have to defend the R plus trainers right back then, because um, I would say that I've been able to, this is going to sound so weird. I, I've been able to successfully, meaning appropriately stress a dog with uh, without the need for corrections, you know, unless you count, uh, denying food or a toy or something like that as a correction or social pressure, but no, like no tool, no, no functional additive of a correction, no positive punisher. And, and it, it was either a, it was either a matter of, uh, simply denying the thing that they like really, really wanted, which I only had to do because they weren't like holding the command or, um, applying enough sheer repetition that, you know, you're not the, the hammer and the nail, which a lot of like these balance trainers love to be, but you're just the sandy water in the ocean carving the Grand Canyon, you know? So sometimes I'll rep the dog out and I'm not turning anything up. No, one, I have no intensity. I have no, no nothing. You know, it's just, I'm not going to give you this until you wait for me to say the word break before you move. And I'll feel that dog become pretty frustrated with me, you know, and even to the point sometimes where I'll cut the frustration and I'll move the dog and and do some easier stuff. Okay, come sit good, down good, and and give them some rewards to get them back. Is there a it, dog snoring? <laughs> it's, it's Simba. I'm gonna lose my uh, my headphones soon. I'm I'm running out of juice here. Yeah, yeah no yeah. worries, uh, no worries. We'll let you guys go. I'm so sorry. This has gone long, and we appreciate your time. Yeah, um, it's been three hours. Wow. I know. Sorry, guys. Um, 
but, yeah. but Mariano, I, I, can I touch on that point? Because yeah, yeah, I yeah. think that is an important thing. And that, that falls into my same point that force free trainers, R plus trainers, whatever, are so concerned, at least in the protection sport world or protection sport, just the sport world about making sure that their dogs are successful all the time mm-hmm. and not letting those errors occur. And then their dogs are still not learning how to deal with errors and, and that stress and training. So mm-hmm. I think that that by itself of just going, yeah, no, I'm pushing you a little bit here mm-hmm. is something that, that um, the other side should be taken away from balance trainers for sure. If yeah. this helps anybody listening, or if this helps any, any of these people, Sarah, then feel free to take this. I, I got this from a trainer friend of mine who's a balance trainer. And he also was a, is a, uh, his Schutzen guy with his dog. Yow. Yow. And, uh, I, I don't, I love that name. Um, he, he would draw things out for clients like this. He would, he would, you know, draw a little column and he'd go plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, plus. And he'd put like 10, 10 things there, seven pluses and three minuses. And he would go, okay, if I did this many reps, and the dog did this one right, this one right, this one right, this one wrong, this one right, this one right. How many of these reps were beneficial? And people would count up the seven pluses and they'd go seven. And he'd go, no, 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 10. Because the dog learning three ways how not to get the cookie is just as beneficial as the dog learning seven ways to get the cookie. And sometimes that includes doing the exact same thing over and over. Because I know we all know you can down good, down good, down good. And then the dog's like, okay, why? Well, I, I get the concept now. How do I, how do I like sidestep the rules here? What if I just like go straight for the treat? What if I bark? What if I, you know, and they try to find out different ways. So sometimes just the sheer good old repetition. And I found the 70 ish percent rule. I call it like 70, 75% rule um, to be very beneficial for me in terms of scaffolding. Meaning if I can push this dog, we're not talking any aversives, just food or denial of food rather. Um, if I can push this dog uh, hard enough that they're succeeding 70% of the time, failing 30% of the time, I'm in a sweet spot. As soon as the dog starts succeeding more often, I'm going to step it up a little to keep them in that 70%. If I ever dip below 70, I'm going to back it off because I want the dog to be much more successful than unsuccessful so that the motivation stays intact. I really like that. Thank you for taking the time to spell that out. Sure. So that's how I scaffold pretty much everything. If I take a dog to a park, I I have two dogs right now that, that are from one household that fight with each other. Um, and that's how I run them, working them separately. And then we started working them together. And then I started walking them as one person with the two dogs. And then like this, if, if they're failing, um, more than they're succeeding, I'm backing off. If they're succeeding too, too much with, with no more, again, it sounds weird to say, but no more stress. I know you guys know what I mean. Then I'm not stepping it up enough. And then I'm getting stagnant. And that's when trainers make that mistake of like, oh shit, they go home tomorrow. Pressure, 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 pressure. And then they fuck it up. Yeah, I really, I really love this conversation, guys. We got to definitely have you guys back on. We are hoping to do a panel of some sort uh, with some, uh, some of the, some of the people that that we we really like. Um, would you guys be interested? As long as it was a good group of trainers. Yeah, but let's not start at eight. Yeah, let's not oh. start yeah, at eight. No. <laughs> ideally, this ideally, is technically ten a.m. Or, or, it was, yeah, two a.m. Taking into account Midwest. Time to oh my that's gosh. all I ask. You, you must be. I mean, Denise is the one that said eight o'clock. So I was like, all right. She had no an idea. Hour. I she didn't had know it was no a four idea. hour interview. You had no idea. We're gonna don't worry, we're gonna chop it in into 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 yeah. three one hour interviews. Don't worry. Excellent. Denise, Excellent. I'm sleeping in your driveway tonight. You know what? <laughs> Just come okay. out and use the bathroom. You can come out and stand <laughs> up. <laughs> all right, ladies. Well, we really appreciate you guys for being on. Uh, those of you guys Absolutely. who are listening to this podcast, thank you so much for finishing the episode. Um, and if you guys found value in this, please share this with some of your dog trainer friends or some of your clients or friends that have uh, have have dogs who might be interested in learning a little bit more about uh, these ladies and what they do. Uh, again, we want to thank uh, Sarah Bruski and Miss uh, Denise Fenzi. You guys can follow both of them on Instagram at Denise underscore Fenzi. Um, and you can follow Sarah at Z- Z- Zoom Dog Training, right? Zoom Dog Training, um, all one word. Cool. Um, if you guys are listening to this podcast on any podcast platform that you guys have, if you guys like this episode, please leave us a review. Um, it's going to be really, really helpful for our searchability. Um, and uh, yeah, guys, thank you guys again so much, Denise and Sarah, for coming back again. We had lots and lots of fun. 
Uh, we're kind of running out of gas right now, but uh, thank you guys so much for sticking it through. I think yeah. this is officially now our longest episode. Uh, it's close. This is like as long as the movie Blood In, Blood Out at this point. Yeah. This is as long. Is this though. is as long as the Snyder Cut. Yeah, Denise, this it was it was such a pleasure. And Sarah, it's it's always a pleasure. Thank you guys again. Yeah, thank, thank you guys you so thank much. Thank you so much. All right, Bye-bye. we'll see you guys later. Peace. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Dog Trainers Podcast, a podcast created by dog trainers, for dog trainers, or anyone who's ever fallen in love with man's best friend. We really hope you guys enjoyed this episode, and we hope to see you back for the next one. But in the meantime, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Dog Trainers Podcast. Go ahead and leave a comment. Ask us any questions that you want. We would love to connect with our dog trainer communities all around the world. Take care, guys. We'll see you next time.